Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this episode, it has been 200 years since some bloke named a megalosaur a megalosaur, and Dave thought that was worth a party. Well, the Natural History Museum did. Anyway, you've got some lovely meandering conversation about all sorts, including the history of dinosaurs, where we think it's going, and I managed to sidetrack Dave with a platypus, because who wouldn't be sidetracked by a platypus? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to It Is Terrible, Is It? I believe this is our 10th series, Dave. Series or season? Which do you like? Sorry, I should introduce, we've got Dr. Dave Hone from Queen Mary University. Yes, um, we agreed series. When, when we very, very first started, we agreed series on the grounds that I refuse to continue with the Americanization of the word season. They're not seasons, they're series. But, you know, isn't isn't that just a season you went through when you were sort of deciding all of those? That was one season. Now no. We, okay. no. Okay. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> It, it's all fine. So there are series. It's nice and easy. It makes sense. It doesn't matter how long they are. They don't have to be three months to be a season. Exactly. And and it's our rules. And this is our dinosaur podcast. You're very welcome. So thank you so much for listening. And thank you to all the patrons who've been supporting the podcast. To give us money. <laughs> yes. Uh, and also, and just generally just chatting and sending us emails and that sort of thing. You are absolutely wonderful. And we thought we'd start this series with a very sort of like special topic because there's an anniversary, isn't there, Dave? Yeah. So last week as of at least of the time of recording as of the Natural History Museum in London because they'd organised a special conference so hello Paul Barrett who did it and hello Susie Maidman who we had on doing Stegosaurs um, who did it because they're at the NHM because it's the 200th anniversary of the naming of Megalosaurus which was the first dinosaur um, so yeah we had a really really cool international conference which was very very nice um, and uh, should we say a few words about that? Yeah I think we should say a few words about Why that because these things you know I was going to say these things kind of don't come round every year but that's an unbelievably patronising sentence on the 200th anniversary conference. Um, but, you know, there are big paleo conferences and big dinosaur conferences, but they're not that frequent. So something like this is quite special. And then it was being in my home city and then HM's kind of my home museum because it's where I always went as a kid and I did do my master's there. Um, that was really nice. But also, you know, there was a hundred odd people, delegates there. Very odd people. Um, about, yeah, definitely. But 30-ish speakers and then a bunch of posters and that included a whole bunch of colleagues and a whole bunch of friends and what's really nice about things like this is you know for example Xu Xing who many people will know that name who's famous the number of dinosaurs he's named and the bird and feather transition stuff I did a postdoc with Xu for three years in Beijing I haven't seen him for 10 years so seeing him was obviously really really lovely and it's the first time I've seen him outside of China as well so seeing him in my own country was really nice so even though we probably only chatted for 20 minutes you know fantastic opportunity to catch up and that was really nice and similarly saw Matt Lamana coming over from the Carnegie haven't seen Matt for probably seven or eight years uh, met Lindsay Zano so the first time I've met Lindsay ever uh, Sterling Nesbitt I think the last time I saw Sterling in person was when we were both in China so that'd be like 14 15 years ago uh, met Diego Paul for the first time from Argentina you know all kinds of people like this and is there a dance do you like get canapes no, no and... there are... <laughs> No, sadly, there, there was a dinner in the um, Marine Reptiles Hall, which I did not attend because it was an unbelievable sum of money. And it turns out I wasn't very well on the day. Oh, so I'm glad good. I didn't pay a lot of money to either not go or go and not enjoy myself. But yeah, you know, really, really cool. There were some retrospective talks. There were some current science talks. There were some kind of future science talks. There were things that I'm definitely not allowed to talk about, which got people very animated and, you know, chatting and discussing what's going to come in the next two, three, four years from various different labs. We've got to keep this podcast going so that we can talk about those then. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so yeah, all, all around it was just generally great. Um, and then a nice little kind of bonus, a uh, very unexpected one because it was unannounced. The Megalosaurus jaw, so this famous front bit of dentary, which is what you see figured time and time and time again. Um, the guys at Oxford, because it's in the Oxford collection, brought it down and... I had a chat with them and we think it's the first time, it's not the first time they've left Oxford, but we think it's the first time they've been at the Natural History Museum. And that's relevant because 
Hylaeosaurus and Iguanodon Nelmantellisaurus are already at the Natural History Museum, so Dinosauria, originally named for three specimens, they were now all together in the same building at the same time for we think the first time ever on the 200th anniversary. So it's, that's that's big. even if it's just like it just you know we didn't all have them in a line or anything, but it's just the fact that that actually happened, and so to be there at an event like that when this is my field is really really nice. This is when like a, an evil super genius would like steal them all in one fell move. And like it would start a great Marvel movie right there. That's that's what you want. It's yeah. like the, the the three relics, the holy most holiest relics. So tell me about this jaw because lots of people. If if you want to know what a Megalosaurus is, have a look at our logo because it's on our logo. Yeah, so that that's the that's the classic um, Owen slash uh, Waterhouse reconstruction at the Crystal Palace Dinosaur Park thing in South London. Um, oh, excuse me. Just just had uh, fajitas for dinner. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, very nice. Very nice. Um, I had a sort of Bombay so, so thought. Yeah, so that, that's a very uh, old interpretation of Megalosaurus. Um, but yeah, this was an animal described in... I was about to go, oh God, when was it? Oh, it was 1824, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that'd be it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I suddenly realised it was quite an easy way of working that out. 200 years. Yeah, had yeah had been known about for a while before that, but Reverend and later Canon and later Dean William Buckland named this in 1824 as a totally new animal. It wasn't a dinosaur yet, because the word dinosaur wouldn't come for a few years yet, um, but it was, in hindsight, the first kind of recognisable thing that was new. And I say that because, again... At least some people are aware of this thing called scrotum humanum. That's hilarious. Um, so this lump of bone, which looks like what it sounds like, uh, which is dinosaurian. Like now we know, you know, it's the end of a femur. It is very obviously a bit of dinosaur, but we don't really know which dinosaur it was. Megalosaurus as a name still stands up. The specimen was sufficient to diagnose a new taxon then and now. And we don't, and it does. It looks a bit like a part of male anatomy, hence why you, you mentioned its shape. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, yeah, but that, that's what it was named as, the fossil remains of a giant human, and this is the bit that we found. Um, it's not, it's the end of a theropod fever. <laughs> um, Easy mistake. But yeah, the Megalosaurus jaw, it's, it's 25, 30 centimetres long. What? There's one really prominent tooth, which is about two thirds out of its socket, so it looks bigger than it should be because it's kind of falling out. There's three, four other teeth that are incipient replacement teeth, so the next ones to come when the old ones have fallen out, so there's just a row of little bumps of them coming through, uh, and a couple of empty tooth sockets, and that's about it. There's quite a bit more of Megalosaurus. There's a nice pelvis, there's a nice hind limb, there's a whole bunch of vertebrae, uh, there's more bits of the skull and jaw. I know off the top of my head I can't remember exactly what we've got. Um, but this is the bit which is always figured and always used and was the the kind of defining piece because it's obviously carnivorous with these serrated curved teeth. Um, so yeah, that is the Megalosaurus jaw. And why is it that in 1824 they decided to... Why was there such an interest? Because I've heard like... I know all about, like, the end of the 18th century, you start to get these cabinets of curiosities sort of popping up and it's terribly fashionable yeah. for people to sort of, like, have a, you know, weird stuff that they've collected to show that, you know, they can afford to travel and that sort of thing. But And buy weird stuff, yeah. yeah. But what is it? Yeah. Because I suppose this all comes, you know, Darwin's not for another sort of 30 years or so, is he? Yeah. So it, it's this sort of timing where people's minds are changing because presumably for thousands of years people have found fossils because they were everywhere yeah but you've got to remember that dinosaurs in that regard are late on the scene in a scientific context because what we don't have a lot of in the uk is dinosaurs what we do have a lot of is marine reptiles mm. so we've already had at this point in 20 30 40 years i don't know very well because i don't do marine reptiles but, you know, Mary Anning pulling out ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and pliosaurs, and then again, not just the stuff from down at Lyme Regis, but we have good numbers of them coming out in places like Yorkshire from various mines. So, of course, people were digging a lot, Industrial Revolution, yada, yada, yada. You know, road building, canal building, um, building houses, building factories, the kind of stuff that needs lots of stone and quarrying and coal, um, and an understanding of geology. Where are we going to find the coal? Where are we going to find the iron ore? Um, means that loads of this stuff was coming out, and we already had the age of reptiles you know you already had these little drawings with plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs you know biting each other's necks and blood going spurt and pterosaurs in the background those were already a big thing we didn't have the land stuff then um and so that was 
And okay, we didn't have something, okay, not the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs are hanging around now, but they were, let's say, more traditionally saurian in that we knew what snakes were, we knew what lizards are, we knew what crocodiles were. These kind of fitted in that mold. Whereas, okay, you don't necessarily see that in Megalosaurus, though you do in the pelvis and the femur if you know what you're looking for. And once we had the nice iguanodon that Mantel was working on, the Maidstone slab, which is still on display in the Natural History Museum today, you can see, hang on, this is an upright animal. Lizards don't walk upright, their legs stick out sideways and they waddle along but this is dinosaurs as we now understand are doing something fundamentally different and yes we didn't have that in 1824 but that's really i think where this starts to be marked out the other thing that they've got is their teeth in sockets Mm. which is a thing that crocodiles have but none of the other reptiles do and crocodiles already recognized as being a bit different maybe a bit special so we are seeing something different in the dinosaurs that again we're not seeing in the other marine animals that were being looked at at that time i want a little sideways jump question so i know everybody's going to go what other other reptiles don't have like teeth in sockets how do their teeth attach what's going on there they sort of just sit on the bone um oh. this, is, this is one of those things that, again i don't actually know the details because i've never had to look into it because i only ever work on archosaurs um but yeah when you look at reptile jaws the the teeth are kind of slightly fused onto the jawbone directly the whereas yeah crocodilians so the group archosaurs which includes crocodiles and pterosaurs and dinosaurs all have mammalian like holes in the jaw that the teeth sit in um and other reptiles don't so it's a really big defining characteristic what's what's your favorite tooth what like ever as an individual one or as in a tooth morphology isn't there a type of seal that has like curly teeth they eat like crabs and stuff. Yeah, cra- crab, eat, crab eater seals. A whole bunch of the ones down there have these really weird teeth because they appear to do some like kind of plankton filter feeding, even though they've got really big, robust teeth. That's one of the things they can do wow. is like filter feed a little bit, I believe, um, whilst also having relatively big crab crushing teeth. So I think leopard seals have something fairly similar, but the crab eaters are the ones where it's really, really noticeable. Is it? Um, no- Freaky. Anyway, that's a bit off topic. If you if you want to like, you didn't spend, get the you know, answer though, which is Demopteran incisors. Sorry, obviously it is. What what's so special about them then? So Demopterans, because that's the first thing people are going to go. What's a Demopteran? Are also called Kalugos or also called flying lemurs? They're not lemurs and they don't fly. This is how biology works. This is why we I talk hate about technical names. No offense. Yeah. This this this, this <laughs> is why we have technical names. So they they well they they glide but they they can't power fly. But they they're, fall, yes, they fall in a controlled manner. They fall in a controlled manner, def, absolutely def, definitely. Um, so like flying squirrels, these are mammals with big membranes between their arms and legs and a big flat tail that glide around in the forests of Indonesia, except they're massive. I mean, the really big ones are like 60, 70 centimetres wingspan. Wow. Whereas a big flying squirrel is half of that. They're their own lineage. There's a half a dozen species or something like that just in this one area. We think they're pretty close to primate origins. Wow. So they're generally, we say... Hence lemury sort of thing. Yeah, because they do look like them. So you've kind of got the primates proper, and then usually, though, again, as usual, when you get to the base of these things, there's lots of disagreement. The next thing is tree shrews, scandentia, and the next thing is the democtrons. So they are quite close in the grand scheme of things to being related to primates. Um, But yeah, they have comb-like teeth at the front of the mouth, which they used for grooming. So these specialised grooming teeth. Nice. They have little cut. They have little combs, and that is really cool That's and weird. It. If only they had like little scissor hands, then you could get them working in barber shops. It's like combing and and two scissors at the same time. I think. Sorry. Anyway, uh, Dave's looking at me with all those. Because we're definitely not going, getting distracted he, from dinosaurs. Not, this is not. This is this is a bit off topic. Uh, but I, you I also started want to say, the sidetrack. My favourite. <laughs> they're not my favourite. What I believe is a flying. And actually, I don't know if it is a fly. In my head, I remember it as a flying one, which is the Volaticotherium, which is yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That That's, that was. That's a, a gliding, a gliding mammal from the Mesozoic. That, that's the best one just for its name. Or mammaliform. Yeah. And I think, yes. is that Jurassic or is that, I think it's Cretaceous. I can't remember. Oh, I think it might be late so Jurassic. It's, it depends which beds. It, so it's yeah. it's from um, northeastern Liaoning, but we've got two different beds there. So we've got the either latest middle or earliest l- late Jurassic, Dahu, Go and associated beds. And then we've got the classic Cretaceous, Ischian and associated beds. And I don't know which one it's from. I think it's Dahu Go, which makes it older and therefore nice. it's Middle Jurassic, Late Jurassic boundary. I, I like the Bolitica theorem, mainly because in my head, it's the only dinosaur named by Philip Pullman. Anyway, so yes. back to the Megalosaur. <laughs> back to 200 years of dinosaurs. 
Well, I don't want to talk too much about Megalosaurs because I'm I hoping know. we'll do a Megalosaur episode. Oh, okay. Soon. Ooh, that's a promise. Um, yeah. So, um, but it was more that, yeah, this seemed like a really nice to talk about that conference, however, briefly and just mention what a great experience it was. And it's nice that these things are happening. And congrats and thanks again to the NHM team for putting it together. More parties, please. But, but also, um, you know, looking back, at 200 years of dinosaurs, which I realise, in hindsight, is a slight error. It's like, oh, what have we learned in the last 200 years? Well, everything, <laughs> because that encompasses the entire history of what we've done, and therefore yeah. that seems almost a bit redundant. But I think we can look at that and kind of say, you know, this is, you know, so, some really nice landmarks. So, for example, you know, Matt Lamada, who I mentioned earlier, um, Matt gave a talk about his work in Antarctica and the Antarctic stuff that he and his team and collaborators have been digging up and just pointing out that, you know, for the first, you know, until like 1984, we didn't have any dinosaurs from Antarctica. And we don't have a lot more than naught now, but the number <laughs> isn't naught. And so, you know, if you look at those 200 years, you've got 180, 60 of them with nothing from the Antarctic. And now we've got a bunch. And when you look at, you know, his speciality is those southern continents. So what would then, you know, its own supercontinent for a while of Africa, South America, India, Australasia, Madagascar and Antarctica... You know, one of the big questions of dinosaur biogeography for the longest time, and it's still a major issue, is how are things getting around? Because there is a pretty obvious land bridge from a large part of this between South America to Africa um, and Australia in particular via Antarctica. And yet we haven't got any Antarctic dinosaurs. So, but who the hell knows? It's just because... Except now we do. It's just so we kn- pal- paleontologists <laughs> in the past were lazy and didn't like, you know, wearing mittens. I think that's all it is. If they just, you know, bothered to dig in the sub-zero conditions where you get killed after five minutes of being outside. Yeah, the, 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 he, he had a, he had a nice photo of um, like the little rubber dinghy, basically, so a little rub, you know, a zodiac to get from the big icebreaker ship to the camp. And they went in the they're in like these special like inflated life suits, so not just a life jacket, but like a whole insulated suit. And they said, if you fall in the water, even in one of these suits, you die in ten minutes. <laughs> and you're like, ah. <laughs> You know, the seas are rough as hell. <laughs> There's ice everywhere. And it's just like, as someone who gets very um, seasick, it's just, just, just absolutely terrifying. I had a friend who went to Antarctica and he, he sailed he sailed all the way from Falmouth, in fact. Oh my God. Um, but he went, I know. I was invited on this trip. Uh, it was quite expensive to go. And I said no. Yeah. Because the last bit of it, if um, between South America and Antarctica, basically storms go through there so bad drake's passage yeah. you have to literally button down the hatch button down the hatches and you just sit in a washing machine until it stops and hope yeah and you're just like i, I know yeah yeah no. um I, I like penguins but yeah no. so tempting to get back on topic again but the but oh, that's yeah, the thing, sorry, you know we've got some theropods down there now including something very dragnosaur like um we've got some ankylosaur type stuff we've got some um ornithopod or um Hadrosaur type stuff. You know, this is important. Hadrosaurs are everywhere. Well, yeah, but there's only a couple of them in South America, and I don't think there's any of them in Africa in the Cretaceous. Okay. Um, and obviously our Australian knowledge is still very, very poor. So, yeah, actually building this picture up and having some times and dates of when these things were around and which ones they look more like. Do they look more like Australia and more like South America? This is all really, really key stuff. Um, the ankylosaur... Um, I can't remember its name now. It might even be Antarctopelta, um, but I can't remember. Um, but that Antarctopelta, yeah. such a good name. Yes, the southern armoured one. But, you know, that's showing things in common with Stegurus, which I think we've mentioned on the podcast. Have we? Stegurus? So Stegurus was named only in the last couple of years. It's this weird little ankylosaur type thing from South America. I want to say pretty north, like somewhere like Colombia or even um, Ecuador, like everything I say on this podcast. I'm just going to say for people following at home, the ankylosaurs are the... Armoured dinosaurs. The squat ones, the flat ones that you usually see with a big swishy tail that smashes into things' ankles and they're armoured and they're yes. like the um, that, that I just wanted to make sure because yeah. people, they so, might have just joined this one day. They might not know. True. 
So St Stegurus is really cool because we don't really have ankylosaurs in the southern continents except Australia and there we've one turns up in South America. As I say, off the top of my head, it was somewhere like Ecuador, so really quite northern and a place we don't usually find many dinosaur fossils anyway. It's tiny, like big dog-sized, when the ankylosaurs in the late Cretaceous could be 8-10 metres long. Killer whale size. You know, 5 plus tonnes. Yeah, basically. And then, normally, you've got your ankylosaurs proper with the big smashy tail club that everyone knows. And then you've got the, oh, the name's dropped out of my head, nodosaurs, which basically are covered in armour but don't have a tail club. They've just got kind of spikes and things. And then Stegurus seems to have split the difference. And it's got, like, flat plates down the side rather than a club. And what it actually looks like to me is, was it the Incans who had those, like, fighting swords? Obsidian swords. Stores. Where it was a stick, yeah, with, yeah. with like shark teeth, like obsidian spikes. That, that's what it looks like. And it's been interpreted as an axe rather than a club. It's sharp, not blunt. Yeah. And Stegurus has like a tail axe, not a tail club. So, and the Antarctic thing looks like that. So it's like, oh, so Antarctica is linked to South America. And that's quite different to the stuff we're getting in Australia. That's really quite big news. And you get that from having only a handful of bits from Antarctica. I mean, unless they could sail and they were actually using their, their tails to cut, <laughs> to cut down trees to make boats. Please, to make that's, their raft, yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that could have happened. Uh, but that's really cool. You know, the fact that, you know, the, the, only in the last 40 years we're actually guessing these fossils and out. Anything at all. Um, you know, and similarly, Australia, bits and bobs had turned up, but Australia has turned up a hell of a lot more in the last 20, 30 years. Why is Australia so unexplored in terms of paleontology? Because I don't think it has many people... Um, the dinosaur stuff is mostly in fairly awkward places to get to. Because there's a lot of mining in Australia. You know, they've got lots of coal mines. There is, but not not of the right rocks, which, of course, is a fairly big problem. Um, I think the other issue is they don't have that bigger tradition of dinosaur paleontology, unsurprisingly, when they don't really have any dinosaur fossils, or at least we didn't think they had any dinosaur fossils. Um, so, you know, you're always going to have that kind of cultural turnover. So, for example... Um, my undergraduate students, we have this year abroad program, students often go to other places, and one of the places they really often want to go to is Australia, because if you're into reptiles and you're into snakes, and I mean, here was a biologist, Australia is one of the places to go, because oddly enough, loads of people do research on snakes and crocodiles and large lizards, because Australia is absolutely heaving with them. And so there's a huge research culture built around that. And that's the thing. If you've never found many dinosaurs, no one's going to study them, and then they're not going to get PhD students to study them, and then there's not going to be all these different labs studying them, and so people aren't going to be asking the government for money to dig them up. So it just doesn't happen. You you know, you've, you've got almost a um, negative feedback loop, which is always going to hinder you. So... Australia has for a long time been digging up the odd bits of dinosaurs. And there's um, uh, Vickers Rich, there's a husband and wife team, and I can't remember their names. Pat is the wife, I think, and can't remember the other. Martin? I mean, they sound like good people. But they, they've done loads and loads of the dinosaur stuff. And so if you see Australian dinosaur stuff, you'll often see Vickers Rich. And pterosaur stuff, we've got some all of the chirons and things down there. But it's often them. Um, but I don't think they're really dinosaur people. I mean, I remember their first big paper was on fossil platypus from the Cretaceous, wow. really, really old. Um, but they're fossil mammal people who are also digging up some dinosaurs and therefore work on it. And that's to their credit. I don't mean that in a dismissive way at all. But again, it's not like oh, we've got a really cool whole skeleton of X, that would make a good PhD project, and then maybe that student would one day get their own research position and then they carry it. That, that's just never really happened. I, there are a couple of people out there, but there's literally, you know, five times as many dinosaur paleontologists, ten times as many dinosaur paleontologists in the UK who frankly have a much worse dinosaur fossil record because we have the opposite. We've always worked on dinosaurs here. It's always been a big subject, and so... We train our PhD students who go into jobs and keep doing that that same research. I've got several questions running through my head. First off, like an idiot, <laughs> I was about to ask, oh, are platypus that old? Obviously, because <laughs> they're very... You found a fossil of them. It's a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> well, no, not obviously we found a fossil of them, but also just everything about them suggests that they're early mammals. They sweat milk and well, stuff. Well, mono monotremes as a lineage are that, are that old, but it doesn't mean that the platypus lineage itself is that old 
I know, but it's, it'd be weird if it weren't, if something had had like the ability not to like. Well, no, lay but, eggs but, and... no, but what, whales have not been around that long, but mammals go back a very long way. So yes. monotremes yes. clearly go back a very long way. It doesn't mean platypus hadn't evolved relatively recently. As it turns out, they haven't. They are really old. Um, Fair enough. But um, I, uh, this is an unrelated question again. Have you noticed everybody? I'm sneaking these in. And he's not he's he's not getting wound up. Why is Australia so full of reptiles and snakes? Is there a I know obviously it's very separate from the rest of like the world and it's surrounded I think because it's really hot. Is that is that literally it? There's a lot of there's a lot of desert. Um you know, reptile diversity massively correlates with temperature. Oh. Um, and reptiles do very well in deserts. And you've got a lot of different habitats, you know. You've got rainforests, got bush. you've got coastal marshes, you've got highland forests, you've got bush, you've got mountains and kind of um, almost low veld and high veld equivalents from South Africa. Um, and then, tr- yeah, true desert. And then even in, you know, true deep desert, reptiles do pretty well when mammals don't. So We need to regulate our heat more than they do. Yeah. Yeah, sad. Pretty much. But um, limited. Well, and they're, they're good at keeping water in, that's the other thing, because mm. they don't sweat. But anyway... Uh, yeah, um, you know, Australia and Antarctica are two really good examples of where we've gone from knowing absolutely nothing, even compared to 50 years or what, 50 years ago, to knowing not a massive amount, but enough that we can answer some key questions and fill in some gaps and go, aha, well, if A, B and C, then probably D, E and F. And we kind of knew it was either D, E, F or X, Y and Z, but this is at least pointing to, to one or the other. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a particularly nice example of what's happened in kind of really recent years, basically. Um, but it still all ties back to this, you know, this wonderful blossoming of everything from Megalosaurus, Scolidosaurus, Hyliosaurus and, and all the kind of stuff that was coming out back then, literally to hundred years ago to i'm trying to think of what was the most recent thing named there was a titanosaur came out i think in the first week of january you know it's we're on this we're recording on the 16th and i think we've already got a new dinosaur species this year so we definitely had one just before christmas so you know the, the just accelerating rate there was a paper out yesterday um on a belly sore growth rate so belly sore is your favorite I do the weirdly short-headed, so horned, micro-armed, weirdly short-legged, pretty big carnivorous dinosaurs from South America. Um, and yeah, there's a really nice paper. I say that, I haven't read it yet. I've seen some of the figures online. Um, but looking at the different growth strategies used of different members of that group, which appear to have been quite varied, more so than I think you'd say for most other groups of dinosaurs from the figures I have seen so far. I really do need to read that paper. But it's just the fact that, you know, bang, we're two weeks into 2024. And I'm like, that's an interesting paper. That looks like it answers a couple of questions. That will feed back into that other project that I'm already doing. <laughs> um, you know, it it just... it doesn't stop <laughs> but that's the thing with knowledge in a good this way is the thing yeah. we've started you know because like 200 years we're still at a very very early stage of understanding an entire subject with i mean you think how long people have been looking at acceleration and gravity and all of that they still not solved that no because the physicists clearly aren't very good at their job uh, <laughs> <laughs> note to physicists listening i do not think that <laughs> i, I can't be that hard, you know, can't we, be. Yeah, we, we, you know, it, I mean, at some levels, we're not that far behind a lot of others. You know, there's a there's a very strong tradition of natural history, but, you know, Darwin was of part of that age where science was becoming, or certainly biology was becoming systematic. Um, but paleontology is always going to lag because we have, you know, a tenth of the researchers and less than a tenth of the research budget. And all of the animals you're studying are dead. And incomplete and... <laughs> Some controversial taxonomy. Yeah. Another nanotyrannus paper, another tyrannosaurus species. I saw that. I was species. a new scientist. I was thinking about asking you about that. I tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to, don't say anything this because I'm going to ask you about that in the uh, special Patreon bonus episode. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it, it is oddly enough a bit trickier generally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, you know, this, this is the point I've always made is that, you know, even something, you know, unbelievably rare, like a, you know, pandas or something like that. There are still zoos that have pandas. There are pandas in captivity. There are skeletons of pandas here, there, and knocking about. And if you really, really want to study pandas, you can scrape some money together and go and watch a panda for a couple of days. I and mean, I'm trying to work out how... Better X... things to do with your money, Dave. That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're going to Chengdu. Pandas. There's loads of them. Um, but you know, I'm trying to work out how this animal fed. What have you got of it? Half a jaw. That's it. That, that is literally it. That's all we've got. That's all we can work from. Got lots of nose tips, but no arms. Um, yeah, or no arms, but no nose tips, or you know, X, X Y, and Z. You know, literally, I wrote a comment about Spinosaurus for for a colleague, uh, a paleo art colleague, um, who was putting something together with Spinosaurus, and he said, "Oh, well, I think the arms do this." It's like you know, we don't actually have arms for Spinosaurus. We've got like one, I think we've got either two wrist bones or a wrist bone and a metacarpal, and that's it. So we don't know. <laughs> so, like, we don't know what it looks like. So when we're arguing about what it could and couldn't do and what it did and didn't look like, if we base it on the nearest relatives, we've probably got a decent idea, but, because we've got a good arm for Suchomimus, but maybe Spinosaurus had a weird arm. We don't know until we oh, don't really hope up. I really hope it's got like like a, a special like, Imagine if it's got like a really long wrist bone, Dave. Imagine <laughs> if it had like some sort of flapping ability. It would, <laughs> it would, oh, it'd be so cool. The water dragon. Um, so yes, it'd be it'd be awesome. But we are sort of playing that sort of game. How far into the game of catchphrase, which is a very British reference? Uh, you know, how many yeah. squares? Or are still on the board uncovered, and what's oh, well, can my, we see what Mr. Well, Chips is doing? Them. So yeah, my my that's that's going to lose so many people. It's going to lose. Um, some. We have we have guys. Those of you who are listening, you are American, yeah, yeah. and if you've never seen British catchphrase, it is it's amazing. Thing of wonder. The, the budget of that, you, you'll blow your minds. It really will. Anyway. Um, so my analogy that I used, I think, in my last book is like a big puzzle, as in, you know, a, a, a classic picture into lots of little squares that you have to put back together. And I think my analogy would be like, yeah, most of the pieces are missing, obviously, and of the pieces that we've got, we've only put various bits of them together but you could give me a, a you know the biggest most complicated puzzle in the world and take half the bits away or three quarters or 90 percent of the bits away and i could still fit a bunch of the others together and i would still know if that scene had cars in it or had sky in it or if there were cows because you just need one cow's head to know there's a cow or a cow's leg or some others or you know the headlight of a car or the blades of a helicopter or something like this you know there are really distinctive obvious things and some bits will plug together and you go oh well that's actually an edge and that's actually a corner and this is a whole little bit that i've put together and even though actually even that bit i've put together three quarters of them are missing it's obviously a row of clouds with some geese flying past it that's what i think it is so we have a lot of this kind of big picture stuff and enough to be able to say quite confidently you know here are is a big patch of bright blue sky with some white clouds and some red-footed geese but i don't know if there's 12 <laughs> geese or 40 geese and i don't know if mm. they're flying a v or on their own and i don't know if there's another kind of geese immediately behind them and i don't know if they're in the foreground or the background so some stuff we know in incredible detail because we've got a little clump of it or it's a really good clear bit rather than just a blue bit of sky because it's like oh there's 10 people in that little bit sitting at a cafe around a table eating tea and cake i can see all of that in that one square amazing detail don't know what's happening two inches to the left of them two squares over and you can't just look at the cover on the box because because we, we haven't got it or at least we can look at modern ecosystems which are similar pictures but not quite the same well that's got some people sitting at a cafe eating tea and cake but it's in the other corner and they're much bigger and take up more space um i'm possibly stretching this analogy too far but i really think it i really think it's superb because you can do it in so many different ways i like this analogy so much dave i'm so impressed uh, but that but that really is what it's like you know oh well when you get geese flying, there's usually some other things below, or there's usually some more in the background, or there's usually a mountain. You know, we, you can extend that metaphor, um, but also just generally the whole thing quite well. And that's why, you know, studying living systems is so important for understanding these ancient ones. But again, there's stuff that's just missing. You know, we can build every modern ecosystem you like, but you're never getting anything bigger than an elephant. And we're going, oh yeah, sauropods. Uh... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a bit bigger than elephants. Um, I just, all I'm really guessing out of this conversation, Dave, is that I can make you happy just by giving you odd bits of jigsaw puzzle and, and then <laughs> that's going to feed the happy part of your brain more than you care to admit. No, I think. my, my mum does them and the other half does them, but I'm not big into I help out occasionally. I like sorting the bits which I think has an awful lot of taxonomist in me. I'm good at sorting the edges and colours and 
certain bit and then let them put it together you do the hard bit the fact that this discipline is only 200 years i mean i say that fact i mean if you look at like you know uh, people who study genetics that's even more modern and the leaps and bounds that's gone on in that sort of yeah field. but but also to make the funding point you know we've got something like the crick institute and there's more people just in the crick institute in the uk than there probably are vertebrate paleontologists in europe probably in the world and that's one institute in one city in one country well, that's because that's they do things like cure cancer dave rather than you know cure curiosity well i i know but you know you you know and just look at my own department and i'm the only paleontologist um i'm the only one they've had since dave norman bizarrely was there for like eight months or something or an 18 month contract 40 years ago and then me and as far as we know there's no one in between and there's like 12 geneticists here now yeah so yeah i think it's fair to say it's a few more it's a bit more money in in genetics and a bit more research going but, on and weirdly though when you ask people about genetics versus dinosaurs way more people more interested in dinosaurs than genes yes so i think <laughs> maybe we should value more conversation <laughs> and <laughs> ancient history that we should you know curing disease um <laughs> understanding you know the basic building blocks of life. Well, I'm glad that you had a lovely time at your party. Is there anything else we should cover in this? Because I feel that... Um, Yeah, I mean, it wasn't quite the right reflective. I was thinking we've just talked about Antarctica and Argentina. Australia in a um, bit, you know. Australia. But yeah, I I think it is... I want to know. On the one one hand, 200 years covers everything. But, you know, and there is, a you know, obviously a mighty oaks from tiny acorns. Exactly. It it was really the starting point. But, you know, dinosaurs have captured the public imagination. That definitely helps for research and funding and bringing people into the subject. You know, like I said, we have far more and a far better marine reptile record in the UK than we've ever had for dinosaurs. And yet there are more dinosaur researchers than there are marine reptiles. So there's no guarantee that dinosaurs were going to take off compared to plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and pliosaurs and giant marine turtles and other very, very cool things. We've, we've not got a terrible pterosaur record. And pterosaurs were known 50 years before dinosaurs. Um, near enough. I need to look that up. I think the pterosaur 250th anniversary is coming soon. Yeah. Um, you better throw that party, so, Dave, because yeah, yeah, it's going to be, and call it Flappy Flap. <laughs> 200, 250 Flappy Flap years. <laughs> list, list of people not being invited to the pterosaur conference. Hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Number one, and the only person on the list is the. Lawrence, um, I do, um, I do think though that point you made earlier about the fact that there is something so unusual about dinosaurs, particularly when you don't immediately see how they relate to birds. The fact you've got these things, bipedal creatures stomping around the place, that are enormous. It does. They feel a lot more alien than something like an ichthyosaur. I mean, they just look like so, fish. Yeah, and I think that's what does it. So I can't remember who it was, but someone was kind of facetiously going, oh, you know, theropods, they're boring, really. Who likes them? Because there, there was already, obviously, between the talks, there was a which is better, T-Rex or um, Edrodontosaurs, was being argued by the various delegates. But yeah, in- increasing that is some of what I think makes Tyrannosaurs in particular because they're so heavy it's like so interesting is not that they weighed seven tons not that they had these giant heads and their weird teeth not that they had weird alarms all which all all of which are very cool and very interesting and very unusual even by therapeutic standards it's the fact there's a bloody seven ton bite <laughs> that's i mean tom holtz has called it yeah a killer whale on legs that's kind of what they are that is a similar head shape and bite power and overall body mass you know stretch a killer whale a bit and pull out some of that tail muscle into a pair of legs move the blowhole and that's kind of what a tyrannosaur is and oh my god it's utterly mental yeah but uh, but sauropods as well the big sauropods are also insane and the fact that we yeah. can't imagine something that even though you know obviously the largest animal that's existed is still alive and it is a blue whale and it is there yeah but we don't see it and yeah. Yeah. But again, I you know, I do wonder if that is part of that thing is like however giant the giant biggest pliosaurs were and biggest mosasaurs were, they're still much smaller than an animal that is fairly common yeah. and to the Victorians where whaling was such a big industry. Giant marine animals were quite normal. Yeah. Um giant terrestrial ones 
weren't. And yeah, even Iguanodon, as reconstructed, okay, we know incorrectly, but as reconstructed, was much bigger than a modern elephant. So right away, you've got things like that. And then again, you know, 20, 30 years later, we're starting digging up stuff like Cetiosaurus. We got the first sauropods. And you go, hang on, this bone's much, much bigger than that of an elephant. And then there's the neck and the tail. Oh. oh um, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing which will, you know, strike a chord. People have always been interested in the biggest of things. And yeah, when the biggest marine reptiles were smaller than modern whales, that's never going to strike home in quite the way that Megalosaurus iguanodon did, let alone when you start getting into the sauropods. I mean, I, I, I find it fascinating, the attitudes, because I think... The pa- paleontology particularly started as, as you explained, people researching almost like if you look at, you know, you've got the whole sort of capitalist sort of look geology, we need to know where the stuff is. But you've also got all of these early zoologists trying to understand God's plan and trying to fit all yeah. of this into the creation story and that sort of thing. And obviously Darwin put a massive, like severed that whole idea. <laughs> Spatter in the words, yeah. yeah. So after that, I mean... It's it's how I, I sort of want to get a sort of feeling. Because obviously dinosaurs are hugely popular when we did the Crystal Palace episode, and they've mm. been so popular in the imagination, and yet, as you say, strangely underfunded. Despite that, yeah. I um, if I could explain that, I would. <laughs> He's not a money man. Um, I'd I'd also have a lot more money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for my research. Um, no, it's it, it's hard to say, almost in a way that I think people like the look of it rather than necessarily, or they like the outputs mm. rather than the process. Um, I guess in the same way that I like that art galleries exist, even if I don't go to them very much. Yeah, that's but there's true. there's tens of thousands of paintings that will never be shown. I mean, I'm um, glad... And that doesn't and that doesn't mean you want to give every random artist a hundred quid to carry on doing their little bit of art, which may never go anywhere and may never be seen by anyone. So we celebrate the successes whilst forgetting, you know, Everybody's the hundreds it. or thousands of people who wasn't, yeah. who isn't in the National Gallery um, or who isn't Michelangelo or who isn't Dali. It is, it is a bit like, I was just thinking, I'm really glad that there is ballet and I really like that that yeah. exists. I've been to one ballet thing and I was surprised that you could hear them thumping. I thought that was... If 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 we if we're if we're going to demonstrating our our, our our artistic ignorance or lack of integrity, um, I've been to one ballet show. I was sure before I went I was going to hate it, but I was willing to try, and I was surprised how much more I hated it than I thought I was going to. <laughs> I really really didn't enjoy pretty much even a second wow. of the entire event. <laughs> So anyone who goes, don't knock it till you tried it. I tried it. I didn't like it. I think that's fair. You don't have to like everything. It really is for cultured people. So, you know. But like I said, I I still know that it's a thing that people like and enjoy. And it is a massive part of culture, you know, Eastern Europe in particular. But, you know, the Russian ballet has always been a big thing. But, you know, not just them, other countries too. Yeah, I'm not saying we should get rid of it. It's it's the trick of the, the, they do do the thing where they leap up in the air and then it looks like they're floating and then they really land heavily. But it does look, they yeah. do manage to sort of get yeah. the illusion by trailing their legs behind them that they look like they're floating. But yeah, this is off the topic of gar- dinosaurs, Dave. We're turning this into <laughs> a special. <laughs> so, and and, and, who, and who, whose fault is that exactly? So you think that the reason that paleontology isn't, even though it's going very fast, we found dinosaurs this year, it is accelerating. It's not accelerating at the speed it could do simply because of, you know, a lack of really uh, it, that thing that w- yeah. there's a lack of funding for ballet. Is it that's the sort of reason, do you think? Um, yeah, it's, it, it's obviously a huge impediment. I mean, obviously, you can make that argument for pretty much any science. You know, give any science more money, even the extremely well funded ones, and they'll just do even more but i guess we've got a combination of there's not many of us we don't have very much money and the sort of stuff we do is often extraordinarily expensive whilst not yielding very much so patago titan you know the absolute giant titanosaur that exhibition was open at the nhm got to see that diego paul i mentioned ran into diego diego is the person who's or the guy whose team found it and dug it up and did the casting and published the paper and sent the cast to the London. Um, you know, and he's got photos of his field team digging this damn thing up. And of course, it's absolutely monstrous. You know, it's the biggest sauropod, you know, it is comparable to the biggest sauropods known, only we've got like half a skeleton. And it took like 40 or 50 of them, you know, mo- 
multiple field seasons to get it out the ground. And that's to get it out the ground. Then you've got to get the rock off it. Then someone's got to store it in a museum, which is incredibly expensive. You know, so we, we talk at my university, we have these regular meetings, I'm sure every academic institute does now, about data archiving. Because, yeah, you, yeah, we've done a genome sequence. We've just generated, you know, 40 gigs of data. Well, that's scientific data. We want that to be around forever. We want it archived on secure servers with multiple copies in different countries, secure against one of them being destroyed in a flash flood or bombed or end of society, whatever. There are cockroaches that eat CDs, so... <laughs> this kind of thing. Right, and how are we going to secure that for like 100 years? Okay, that's it. That's expensive. It's nothing compared to a climate-controlled building for one dinosaur skeleton. Um, that right, you know, that big. It, it isn't. It's paid us. So yeah, we're doing something that takes a vast amount of time to generate one data point. You know, I you get a team of field biologists. If I told some of my colleagues who were doing like you know animal surveys in Borneo and said you can have fifty people for three months. For the next five years, they'd come back with more data than they'd know what to do with. Diego has a skeleton. So <laughs> maybe we should work on something a bit smaller. That's that's the only thing. Well, that's why I don't do sauropods. <laughs> we need we need we need, what we need sure. is we need some sort of like, you know, the physicist, I blame them again. They need to come up with some sort of shrink gun. A shrink ray. Yeah, that would so help. we can shrink it down and then we can blow it up again when we need, need it, it and shrink yeah. it down again. And it's sort of that would be perfect. So if anybody knows any physicists listening, get yeah. on it, please. If, if Hank Tim is be... out there, give us a shout. That would be great. Um, exactly. I saw a film when I was a child called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. kids. Yes. I know it's possible. I know it's possible. Yes. We, could, we could do that. <laughs> there are lots of foam grass. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's our retrospective of a couple of countries and moaning about the state of paleo funding. I think this is. <laughs> I think this was a lovely way to start 2024, Dave. I think it's just a gentle, it's been a lot. Everybody's a bit sort of like, Oh, so we've got a year coming up in terms of there's going to be a lot of news generated this year. And I think we just need to stay with the dinosaurs. Join us, learn <laughs> about dinosaurs and be happy. I think that's what we need to do. So thank you so much um, for listening, everybody. Um, you'll hear me do my spiel at the end about, you know, being a patron. But if you are a patron, um, thank you again. It does uh, mean the world because both Dave and I have very, very busy people. And this means that we can get somebody into edit and do that sort of thing. So we could definitely get the episodes out to you. I'm going to mention this in May and I'll put this on our Patreon um, where we're doing a live show in Oxford. Tickets will go on sale or should be on sale now, I think. Um, so do, I'll put, I've put it up on the Patreon um, and on our website. So you'll know about that. Um, but that, I believe, did, did I, I told you when it was, Dave, do you remember? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, of, in, it's, in, it's in May. It's May. 25th? Yes, May 25th my at 3 p.m. In Oxford. There you go. So, um, you know, if you want to come and see us live and say, hey, we'll be there. It'll be fun. Dave might even bring books for you to buy, mightn't you? He's looking at me like, no, I won't. Oh God! Well, I'm gone, so I've got well, like I two you spares. Can order books from the publishers, Dave. Get them. Okay, okay. Dave won't be selling <laughs> publishers books. Publishers are not my favourite people some of at the his moment. Books and take <laughs> them with, and, and you can. He will. He'll have books. Well, you will have books, and he's happy to sign your books. And that's. I'll have a it. pen. We can make things Boom. happen. There we go. There's a promise. Promise to 2024. We're keeping it light. We're going to have a pen on us. That is our New Year's resolution. But until next week, should we do a massive megalosaur roar for everybody? <laughs> going to make me whether I want to or not exactly I am three two one all oh, my throat's gone <coughs> thank you for listening to this episode of terrible lizards you are amazing if you're a patron you're double amazing you can support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards or just go to terriblelizards.co.uk and follow the links if a bunch of extra content and having your questions answered doesn't appeal you can always support the show by leaving us a review please do share it with your friends it does make a massive difference and if you want to support either dave or myself individually please go to our prospective websites davehone.co.uk or iszizzy.com you can get our books mine have got nothing to do with dinosaurs but anyway squawky bye bye